Good morning. My name is Basil Leonard and it is my privilege this morning to take you through Mandela's Conversations with Myself, which is our first We Read for You for 2012. In this particular book, which can almost be seen as the sequel to Long Walk to Freedom, Mandela catches for us a lot of his very private moments, which I'm afraid many of the other books have not been able to show or to indicate. So I trust that you will enjoy the session with us. The foreword, as you know, is by Barack Obama, the US President. Uh, there are three major parts you'll see in a minute that comes out. His own conversations he has with himself, his own little notes that he kept, his conversations specifically with two people, um, Ahmed Kathradra and, of course, uh, Richard Stengel. So that's most of it. And then the third part is they were thinking of having a sequel to Long Walk to Freedom. And Mediva had already started making his notes for that. And so for this particular book, they actually drew on all of this to put it together. I'd like to start by giving some insights. They say interviews over the years have found it almost impossible to penetrate who this man really is. Being on the island or in Victor Fester, they are, and in Paul Smoor, it's actually interesting to notice how many times he says, you are just by yourself. So what he was busy doing was drafting letters, drafting speeches, drafting memoirs, making notes during meetings, keeping a diary, recording his dreams, tracking his weight and blood pressure, maintaining to-do lists, meticulously so. And then, of course, meditating on his experience. I like this one. Interrogating his own memory. So it's not the icon of the saint that is elevated far beyond the reach of ordinary mortals. No, in conversations with myself, Mandela is like you and me. And I think it is very humbling of him to actually reveal so much about himself. In real life, we deal not with gods, but with ordinary humans like ourselves. Men and women who are full of contradictions, who are stable and fickle, strong and weak, famous and infamous. So a little bit about Mandela, the recorder. The book reminds us that for most of his adult life, Mandela has been a diligent maker of records and an obsessive record keeper. And then, of course, his habit of drafting most of his letters in a notebook during the prison years. Remember now, he's writing a letter, say, to one of you. So before he actually writes the letter to you, he would draft it. And then that's what he kept back. Because many of the letters that were sent out were never recovered, you see. But the interesting thing about that, too, is for another reason. He discovered much later, and I may say it a little bit later on as well, that many of the letters that he actually gave to people, uh, sorry, to the prison wardens to post for him, were never posted. But there's another reason that comes through, which shows the difficulty that they had on the island. He says, whenever you wrote a letter, you were always aware of the fact that there's going to be a censor who's going to read that letter before it goes out to the person. He says, and yeah, I am sharing real personal stuff with this person. And I know that person will not be the first to read it. Sadly, though, the archive that he had collected over the years were ravaged by his years of struggle, of his life underground, of his life in prison. Also, sadly, records were secreted away or given to others for safekeeping. Some were lost, confiscated by the state, destroyed, later used in evidence. But while his private archive is scattered and fragmented, the single biggest accumulation right now is found in the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory and Dialogue. So what you have in the book are photographs throughout of some of these documents. And those are the four areas that I mentioned earlier from which the actual materials were drawn. First is prison letters. And the book says some of his most poignant and painful writings are to be found in two hard-covered exercise books in which he carefully drafted copies of letters. <coughs> and they date from 1969 to 1971 and cover the very worst time of his imprisonment. 
interestingly, this was actually stolen by the authorities in 1971 and then were returned to him by a former security policeman in 2004. So some people do change. The second is, of course, those taped conversations. And uh, there are 50 hours, 50 hours of conversations with Richard Stengel and 20 hours of conversations with Ahmed Kathadra. And then thirdly, those notebooks that he kept, that's where he got a lot of it. They do say, though, that he resumed this very same practice in the years after his release. And uh, also during his presidency. And then the last is that unfinished sequel to Long Walk to Freedom. So that gives you the sources from which these particular manual was put together, conversations with myself. And in the book it points out that many of his distinctive habits were actually acquired early in life. One of the most important from his traditional background in Tembulan was listening carefully to his elders and to all who spoke at tribal gatherings. And the second one, watching a consensus gradually emerge. Habits of discipline, order, self-control, respect for others were demanded by both traditional authority and the educational institutions at which he studied. And some of us know the story of how he used to make his own bed even when he was released. And I mean, now he had people serving him, but he still insisted he'll make his own bed. Because it's a discipline that was embedded in him. That order, that self-control. From seven, he attended a one-room school in Gunu. Later, he schooled at Clarkbury Boarding Institute and the Wesleyan College of Hilton. He completed his first degree at the University College of Fort Hare. And then in 1941, of course, he left Tembuland and the Eastern Cape for a different life and a larger destiny. The second part of the book is actually referred to as drama. And a lot of the background comes again from who he was as a person. Now, I didn't know this, but I found out that he actually once played the part of John Wilkes Booth at Fort Hare. And he also played the tyrant Creon when the prisoners put on Antigone on Robben Island. He also quotes from Shakespeare, had a taste for Greek tragedy, which again he first read on the island. He also joked at one time about being an actor. And during the years of his political apprenticeship, he learned the power of the dramatic gesture. From the late 1940s, he assumed leadership positions in the ANC and also through the 1950s and early 1960s, participated prominently in every national campaign and event in the struggle against apartheid. And also the book mentions he actually became the Black Pimpernel, South Africa's most wanted man. His personal, and this is where a lot of his private life comes through, and a lot of it, I can assure you, actually hurts when you read it. His personal drama, of course, heightened when after a couple of passing affairs, the book says, he married a young relative of Walter Sasulu, Evelyn Marseille, in 1944. <coughs> they had four children, two daughters, and two sons. But after 12 years of marriage, they separ separated with bitterness and acrimony. And this caused considerable unhappiness in the family in later years. And then, of course, that picture needs no introduction. In 1958, he married, the book says, the radiantly beautiful Winnie Madikizela. And then they make an interesting point about her. They say, he always admired strong women, but he did not perhaps appreciate how strong Winnie would turn out to be. The third part of the book is called Epic and uh, five very interestingly titled chapters. It says, viewed from the vantage point of the present, the whole of Nelson Mandela's life seems to have carried the energy of legend and the weight of epic narrative. And this is where chapter eight comes in. His story is woven into the story of South Africa's journey from colonialism through apartheid to democracy and that long walk to freedom of a nation was unimaginable without Mandela's personal long walk. It's as if saying, 
it's so interwoven there's no way you can actually take him out of it they mentioned that of course conditions on robin island were for the first years very harsh he says the food was poor the work was hard the summers were hot the winters were cold the waters were brutal and the one thing that really gets to him is the fact that initially initially only one short letter and one short visit were allowed every six months you were never private think of that you were never private there was always maybe somebody watching now when he moves over to Portsmouth they mention in the book that a lot of his privileges now became more and this is of course from 1982 only especially after he inaugurated talks about talks with the apartheid regime in 1985 many of us who are in this room will actually remember that and so they moved him from the island and gave him a few more privileges and then of course they move him to Victor Fester in December 1988 and there he occupied a spacious bungalow house of his own and for the first time he could see or communicate with whomever he liked also interesting he was frequently taken on trips out of prison sometimes for high-level meetings sometimes simply to see the sights I like this he was already a president in waiting the last part of the book is <coughs> tragic comedy and again you can see the whole understanding of his interest in drama the years after his release from prison the book says was extremely cluttered for him because here he was preoccupied with organizing the ANC conducting negotiations preparing for the elections governing as a president traveling the world as a most celebrated leader and very personally coping with the pain of divorce from Winnie. Now we all remember that we saw him and Winnie walk away on the day that he was released and very soon thereafter this happens so again the pain stays with him. We also remember that the period 1990 to 94 was one of blood and fear in South Africa. Thousands of course died in political violence we remember the massacres at Sebokeng, Boipatong, Vishu. And here he says in the book throughout, there was a palpable fear of a right-wing military-backed coup, but it was pragmatism that drove the negotiations and the policy of reconciliation. The conversations that he had with Richard Stengel and Ahmed Kathrada for his authorized book projects, projects took place at the same time that he was either keeping the country together, that's before he was uh, inaugurated, and then actually running it. Nelson Mandela's remembrance of his prison years is not without nostalgia. The routine, the camaraderie, the lessons learned, the time for reading and study, the time for writing letters, for contemplation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is conversations with myself.